for a moment. We're going to start in a minute or two, but I'm going to make myself really unpopular now and ask everyone to move down to like the first four or five rows because it would be really brilliant to be able to have a sort of collective conversation, which is hard with loads of empty seats so, and people far away. So if those in the back wouldn't mind moving down, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Look, seeing guys. Let's let's make a start. I'm uh, Rebecca Willis. I'm a research fellow at iGov at the University of Exeter. I'm really pleased to welcome you here today for this session on uh, what we need out of our energy governance system. Um, I'm going to attempt to do the most interactive session possible in the most traditional lecture theatre possible. So that's my challenge. And if I don't fall off the stage, I will take that as a win. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the, um, the, the basic idea that we want to discuss this morning... Um, hi, welcome. If you want to come down to the front, that would be brilliant. We're well, not right at the front, but... <laughs> Uh, we're trying to group everyone reasonably far down. So the basic idea that we're going to discuss this morning is that the um, established regula regulations and institutions that essentially govern our energy system were designed 30 years ago. And they were designed 30 years ago when the energy system looked very different and the, the outcomes we wanted out of the energy system were very different from what they are today. I mean, just, just to pick two examples, the kind of innovation, the kind of new products and services were completely different to what we're seeing today, as we've heard a lot over the last couple of days. And carbon reduction was, was nowhere in that, in that governance system. Um, so there have been huge changes, and we've tried to adapt this 30-year-old system in a piecemeal way, and what we've been looking at at iGov and what we'd like to discuss this morning is what actually would a, would a reformed energy governance system look like that would allow us to achieve the outcomes that we want out of the energy system. So what we're going to do this morning is try and crowdsource an answer to that question. Uh, we're going to do this by, we've got some amazing panellists who I'll introduce in a moment. I'm going to give them, um, they've said, I've said three to five minutes, but I'll give you a minute's warning. Um, we're going to just ask them to um, give their views on firstly what they think is the biggest governance block um, to, uh, the biggest governance block to, um, transformation of the energy system, and then just one or two suggestions for change. So we're going to go to the panel first. Catherine's going to stay quiet for a little bit. Um, then we're going to go to you um, as participants and get your views. I'm going to try and map all this on my tiny whiteboard. Um, and then we're going to go to Catherine, who's going to introduce iGov's uh, draft governance framework and see uh, whether or not your ideas match that and how we can, how we can revise that accordingly. So this is a live document which we are working on at the moment. Uh, we'll do that and then we should have a little bit of time left for um, some more comments from you um, and from the panel, at which point we'll try and close down and work out where there's consensus and where there really isn't um, a shared view of what needs to change. 
So that's the plan. Uh, we will see if it works. Um, it would really help if, um, if you could take it in that spirit and the panel as well and make this, you know, uh, if, 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 we, if we have sort of short, punchy contributions building on each other's thoughts and um, if you can say where you agree and also where you disagree, um, might do a little bit of voting. So uh, we'll actually try and build that collective picture. Is that all right with everyone? Yep. Okay, brilliant. So uh, let me introduce our panel. Um, really pleased that we have uh, Guy Newey, who's Strategy and Performance Director at the Energy System Catapult. Um, Charlotte Ramsey, who's Program Director at National Grid ESO. Is that right, Charlotte? Yeah. <laughs> Mary Starks, who's Director of Consumer and Markets for Ofgem. And Catherine Mitchell, who's uh, Professor at the iGov Project. Um, so I'll just go uh, Guy, Charlotte, Mary, if that's okay. Um, and I'm really sorry if I'm strict and cut you off, but there's loads of chance to come back later in our amazing interactive format. So uh, off you go, Guy. So at the Energy Systems Catapult, which is the innovation centre, we, we like hard problems. Uh, so this is the ideal, uh, ideal panel for that. So what... Taking a step back before we get to the, the, the governance questions, what are the hardest things we're tr trying to achieve in decarbonisation? What are the, the toughest problems that we at the Catapult kind of uh, grapple with? And there's, there's, there's loads, you know, it's a tricky, tricky old problem, decarbonising the e economy as fast as we can. And the two that, that repeatedly we come back to, one, uh, heat, how do we decarbonise heat? And uh, crucially, the other one, which doesn't get uh, a lot of attention yet, what are the risks and opportunities of digitalization in, in energy. Heat, we kind of talk about as a problem, or the, the, the kind of debate talks about problem a lot. It is about as complicated as, as it gets. It's a consumer problem, it's a systems problem, it's a technology problem, finance problem, political problem, uh, et cetera. And we do a huge amount of work in our smart systems and heat uh, program uh, in the past looking at that, and we'll do a lot more going forward. Digital, uh, energy talks a good game on digital. Um, but it's really right in the foothills of what the opportunities uh, and, crucially, the risks uh, might be, but it's coming very, very um, fast. So what are... So I think about if those are the, the two of the trickiest problems. What are the regulatory blockers to, 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 those, to these problems and, indeed, uh, the wider transformation and what might we do about it? So one... Um, one candidate is, is pretty easy, actually, which is not, not an easy problem to introduce, but an easy problem to identify, which is about local area, uh, proper local area energy planning. So we're, part of our work, we've done a bit of it in, or a lot of it in Newcastle and Bridge End in, in Manchester, trying to really understand what that, uh, what that really means at a local level. And it's very, very hard. The data is uh, crap. Um, uh, capability is uh, sometimes limited. They've got lots of vested interests, people not talking to each other. It takes, it's, it's, it's really hard work. Government's making some steps towards that, but it's still, and, and off gem as well, but it's still kind of to need to be convinced uh, that this is, this is a problem. But from a, from, a, from a governance point of view, who are the right institutions to, to think about that planning is, is, is really important. We've got energy hubs, kind of questions around next stages of Rio, uh, uh, et cetera. But it's that kind of systems yeah. thinking, actually thinking about how these things work, is, um, is, is absolutely essential. You need to understand what your housing stock is so you can think about heat solutions. And then you also need to understand what your grid capacity is. If you don't get all of those working together, then, um, then you're going <coughs> then, then to you're, then you're be limited in what you can do. And particularly for heat, that becomes uh, a massive problem, which is inherently uh, decentralized, as it were. Um, but that's not what I would identify as the kind of biggest uh, block to the, the transformation. For me, the biggest <coughs> block to the transformation is that we don't really have a good way of thinking about how all of this stuff fits together. Um, uh, this is particularly a problem in power and becoming a pressing problem in power, but it's, um, it's this, 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 this how it all fits together is a really issue. You know, certainly in the power sector, you've got you know, CFDs, capacity market, 
uh, whether you're going to build a new nuclear policy, what the right mechanism for that is, balancing market and solution services, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And bits of them are controlled by bit, different bits of the, uh, of the firmament, as it were. And the, the truth is that at the moment, Bayes is the systems architect. Um, but I don't think as an institution it realises that. Somebody worked there for, for, for a few years. Um, I don't think it's comfortable with the idea and uh, certainly doesn't have the skills to actually approach that. It's very, very siloed. So, you know, they're not set up for a, for a whole systems approach um, in that sense. Good. Um, and also, you know, that, that, you know, and that doesn't reflect the changes that are going on in the industry, the fact that, you know, I can buy, or in fact, have just bought my car from an energy supplier that I'm not, doesn't actually supply my energy. You know, these, these, these silos are, are, breaking, uh, are breaking down. So how do we bring all of this, um, how do we bring all of this together is, the, is, the, is, the, is the, the, the really trickiest block at the moment. And how can we adapt quickly to the pace of change of, of technology, which is why in Greg Clark's speech in November, the kind of agile governance, which is probably the least sexy thing, uh, uh, I remember thinking about how we'd ever actually announce something like that, um, but is, is absolutely essential in the code review process is uh, definitely in that boring but very important uh, category. I'm pretty relaxed institutionally about who that systems architect, for want of a, uh, uh, a, another term, is. So I'm really interested to hear what Catherine said Say, uh, goes to say about that. But the key point is, if we don't get this right, if we don't get this, uh, this, this sense of how this all fits together and how it <coughs> adapts, then this issue of digital could become a major risk for the in industry. You're going to get stuck with a particular um, uh, company just because once you bought an Alexa uh, 15 years ago and you didn't, you didn't think about it. This interoperable question is, is really important. And you're going to create new digital monopolies, which will potentially have bad outcomes for, for consumers. Great. Thank you very much. Charlotte. Thank you. Mm, um, very good. So I, I'd like to talk about the concept of transformation more in the abstract as opposed to specifically going into what might need to be achieved to achieve elements of the energy system transformation. And the reason for that being I've just spent the last three years of my, of my life, of my career, trying to achieve a transformation in a component part of the energy system. So I've been leading within National Grid, I've been leading the implementation of legal separation, a kind of a component part of the governance structure that we see today, but a component part of what I think government and the regulator wanted to see as a part of the transformation. So creating a more independent electric, electricity system operator that would allow the SO to step up to new roles that would support energy system transformation more generally. So it's given me a lot of insights at the coal face of how to achieve transformation and what some of the barriers are to changing our institutions and our organisations. Um, so I think if I, if I think about your first question of what's the biggest um, government or regulatory blocker to transformation and transformation in the abstract, I go really high level and I go right up to it's, it's people that make this change and it's leaders that drive the change. And as, as far as I can see from my recent experience, one of the biggest blockers to transformation, achieving transformation and achieving it over a time frame that's needed, which is a very short time frame, so change and transformation needs to happen fast, the biggest blocker is a real absence of visionary, aligned and consistent leadership amongst all of the institutions and, and kind of regulatory institutions that we have today and including National Grid in that picture, including all of the kind of component parts of the, of the system. And it's, it's a human thing, it's not a, um, I mean there, there is a challenge of there not being a kind of a, a, a clear vision, but it's a human thing, it's people who need to be aligned, it's our leaders, the leaders of those organisations, who need to be aligned about what they're trying to achieve. And just to bring that to life a little bit, um, the legal separation project was something that was signed up to by Bayes, Ofgem and, um, and National Grid back in January 2017. Um, Guy was um, intimately involved in, in some aspects of, of, of this and so you might remember that at the time, although there was a lot of bilateral interactions between the three individuals that signed that tripartite agreement, 
the three never met in person when they signed. It was signed electronically. So right at the very beginning of this transformational activity for National Grid, there wasn't that alignment of human beings who are sitting in the same room and saying, do we agree with what we're about to do? Are we all on the same page here of what we're trying to achieve and why? And then now we come to April 1st, 2019, we have achieved separation of the electricity system operator. There's a new business sitting within National Grid Group. It came out on April 1st with what I think is a really visionary and ambitious 2025 strategy saying we want to achieve zero carbon operation of the electricity grid by 2025. Wow, that's amazing. And I think that wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for legal separation. But I can tell you the journey to get there wasn't easy. And are we set up to have the most impact as a legally separate entity? I'm not completely sure. And I think one of the reasons why A, it's taken so long and B, I'm not completely sure is because there isn't complete alignment from the leaders in all of the organisations that have affected that change around why that change happened and what it needs to be to be able to sustain transformation of the system more generally. So yeah. biggest barrier, lack of visionary aligned and consistent leadership about what we want to do to achieve the transformation. Um, second question, how does regulation need to change to allow innovative local and regional solutions to flourish? Um, I'm kind of stepping away from the innovative local and regional solutions and just stepping back into the bigger picture. You want to achieve a transformation and I can pick on Ofgem but I think it's, it's a question for all of the institutions that sit within the governance framework that we have today. The regulator and everyone needs clear and visionary objectives that are aligned to the future state. So, where I sit in National Grid ESO, we get a lot of pressure, rightly, to be thinking outside of the box that our regulatory framework sits us in, to be more proactive in suggesting how we ought to be regulated in order to create change. And I would put the same challenge to all of the other institutions that sit in this space. Ofgem should be thinking about what future regulation looks like. They should be thinking about transformation of the regulatory space putting in place objectives which are transformational, which move away from talking about protecting electricity and gas customers and consumers and talk about whole energy system concepts. So every single organisation needs objectives which are reflecting the future state to allow them to then build strategies around how to transform to that future state. It's impossible to think about driving transformation if you don't have targets that put you in that transformational state already. I'm done. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mary. Over to you. Um, <clears throat> so thanks very much. I, mean, I certainly recognise a lot of a lot of what's been said. I recognise the the thirty year old picture that you that you painted at the beginning. Um, I mean, Ofgem was set up originally post privatisation to uh, basically regulate monopoly networks and drive out particularly to help drive out operating efficiency that was perceived to have, op operating inefficiency that was perceived to have uh, grown up in those networks uh, under public ownership. So that was its kind of um, starting reason for being. Um, now, obviously, a lot has changed since then. Um, uh, the, the industry has changed enormously. Uh, other issues have come up, and Ofgem sort of accreted new uh, new responsibilities as time has gone by. Most recently, uh, retail price capping because of discontent about um, the fairness of pricing in, in the retail space. But I think it is fair to say that uh, Ofgem hasn't had a fundamental rethink of what its purpose is in the current um, in terms of the current energy challenges. Um, Regulators are funny, funny places. I've worked in several of them. We don't, we don't like to rethink our own objectives. We like to do what we're told by Parliament, and we think it, we've got a rather sort of precious view that it is for Parliament to tell us if, if the job has changed. But that's a precious, but also rather naive view. And I think there probably is, um, there is room for, for, definitely room for getting involved in, in that discussion. But it is true that ultimately Parliament, Parliament decides what our job is. Um, I mean, as I say, the job has changed. Uh, we've become increasingly involved in the retail market, getting very um, involved in issues around fairness in, in pricing, who pays for energy, who pays for decarbonisation. Uh, these are very sort of politically salient issues. Um, we've also started focusing much more on supporting innovation. Uh, that's been primarily with a view to trying to get out of the way. So we, we're 
acutely aware that regulatory systems tend to be built up around incumbent models, the last generation models. Um, the incumbent interests have a strong view, a strong sort of interest in preserving the status quo, and regulators need to be quite, um, you know, need to have our antennae up for uh, how is the regulatory framework getting in the way of new people wanting to do new things differently. So we have a, an innovation service that. Um, where, whereby we try and listen to innovators and understand how the regulatory framework is getting in, in their way. And the number one thing that they tell us is that the codes framework is, um, is a problem. Uh, so the, the code system is impenetrable, there's just too much of it, it's too complicated, it's, uh, it's very reactive rather than strategic, so um, you know, an individual party can raise a modification, but then everybody else has got to agree to it. There's no kind of strategic, visionary, driving force there. And it's very easy to block change and very hard to push change through. So I think codes reform is is really boring, but really a priority. Uh, it's going to be, it, it's, we're going to have a job, um, we're going to have a job making that a political priority, I think, because it is so dull, but it is clearly one of the things that's, that's in the way. Um, the other things that uh, the innovators tell us are, are in their way. Um, we have uh, a system of obligations that are put on electricity suppliers. We have a rather old-fashioned view of, of the world. We give out licenses for generation, distribution, transmission, and supply, um, and now being an ESO as well. <laughs> um, but the supply license was uh, built on a mental model of a small number of large suppliers who all aim to be all things to all people. So it's a kind of big six oligopolistic mental model. There are a lot of um, obligations that suppliers bear. These days we have more than 70 suppliers in the market. Um, many of them want to be very niche. They don't want to be all things to all people. And actually this system of obligations on suppliers makes that quite difficult. Uh, there are loads of different kinds of obligations, environmental obligations and the rest of it. The one that um, that uh, companies often struggle with is the universal service obligation. The idea that you have to be able to offer um, electricity to anybody who wants it is actually quite a problem if you only want to offer energy to people in one particular community in Wales, say, um, or only to people who drive an EV. So there's, the, there are various issues there. Um, I think there is an issue around... Um, off GEM's duties. Uh, our duties are to protect the interests of current and future consumers. We, we can take quite an expansive view of that and we would certainly encompass um, the UK commitment to uh, decarbonise and, and climate change as coming sort of broadly within the interests of, of future consumers. So we don't, we don't feel that gets in, in the way, but there are some oddities around it. Um, so on carbon reduction, we feel that our job is to support government policy. Um, our actions should be consistent with government policy, but we don't see ourselves as the engine for uh, finding the policy solutions to, to decarbonise. Um, we, so we don't have it as a, as a primary objective. We, uh, we can struggle a bit conceptually with cross-sector issues. So who should pay for electric vehicle infrastructure? Should it be just a pure merchant model like petrol stations? Um, should it be uh, energy consumers under a monopoly model or should it be road users on some, under some kind of um, road tax model? So with the sort of the cross-sector issues can present a challenge and you know, there's obvious cross-sector issues between energy and transport, energy and housing. Um, that, that's, uh, that's not clear in the way that we're set up. Um, I think there's also, there are some issues around uh, local energy uh, so we've been set up very much with a, a national legal framework. Um, we can just about, we think, accommodate different preferences for Scotland, because Scotland largely has a different system, so if Scottish consumers want to pay more for a different kind of system, we can probably accommodate that. Harder to do for Wales, pretty hard to do for Manchester. Um, so we, there are some sort of uh, issues there where the legal system within which we operate uh, is not terribly well aligned with the sort of political um, systems and political preferences that, that are expressed. And this has not yet been a problem. We haven't yet had a, a case where, you know, the, the political system tells you one thing and the court tells you something else, but it's, it's something that could, could happen. Fine. Um, so I'll, I'll wrap up uh, quickly. The, in terms of how regulation needs to um, change, I would say 
code reform. Um, I would say also we need to get away from um, the sort of ex existing very traditional boxes that we give out licenses in, generation, transmission, distribution, supply. Uh, I, as I've recently moved over from financial services from the Financial Conduct Authority, and in financial services you have activity-based regulation. So broadly there's a prohibition on um, doing something that is a regulated activity unless you have permission to do it but then there's an evolving list of what is a regulated activity that the treasury owns and it can add things onto it and take things off it and it's a it's a more evolving way of figuring out what you need to regulate so i think a move towards activity based regulation would be uh, would be positive um, I think greater clarity, a sort of a modernising and an updating of, of off-gems duties would undoubtedly uh, help. I wouldn't want to overstate the, the extent to which that's in the way, but because you can, you've got quite a lot of wiggle room within what feels like an outdated framework, but it is an outdated framework. I would give you one other example. I think our duties in respect of vulnerability are framed in terms of protected characteristics and people who live in rural areas. And we've managed to just sort of take a slightly more modern uh, view of, of vulnerability within that but but it does when you look at the statute it does feel a bit dated um, and then I think the last thing is uh, stronger central governance uh, and again this comes back to codes reform but stronger central governance around data sharing standards interoperability um, and quite how the sort of world of reformed codes and the world of the uh, system operator and potentially in future uh, independent system operator um, quite how those worlds sort of relate I think is is well worth exploring but um, some one way or the other uh, some sort of stronger uh, technocratic standard setting um, machinery in the center of industry that that is more forward-looking and, and strategic uh, than we've currently got would be very welcome Thank you. That's me. <laughs> Great. Um, really good list there. Yes. Um, so I'm going to um, ask Catherine to uncharacteristically stay quiet just while we hear from participants, if that's all right. If that's so um, let's run through what we've got. I mean, there's, 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 um, there is, I think, some consensus from our panel about, I mean, Charlotte, you, you expressed the... Um, you know, the need for visionary aligned and consistent leadership, I think you said, and that's the kind of people side of it. Um, the, um, and I think other panellists referred to that as the, you know, the, the question around systems architect um, and having, uh, having clear objectives. Um, a lot of issues around coordination and cross-sector, particularly energy, in, uh, energy into the digital space, I think. Um, and then some specifics around... Um, off-gem duties and uh, codes and the way that um, the way that um, uh, standard setting works. Um, so those, I think, were um, some of the agreement we had around the difficulties. Um, the reform. What's interesting about the reforms to me, and maybe we can reflect on this, is that we've got some very, very top-level. Uh, reforms around the need for agile governance, the need for um, uh, clear objectives, and then we've got quite a lot of sort of much lower level things in terms of um, codes, sort of the, the, the again, again, getting right down into the nuts and bolts in terms of codes reform and, um, and uh, activity-based regulation and um, standards for data and so on. And I wonder if there's a m middle layer missing. I don't know. I'll just throw that out there, whether, you know, what comes between the sort of visionary statement and all the, the, the nuts and bolts of, of codes reform. Um, so uh, that's my probably imperfect summary. What I would like to hear now from you, if when you... Um, when you intervene, if you could just say um, who you represent or, or what you work on as an academic. And um, I would like to know which of this you agree with or w w basically, is there anything here you violently agree or disagree with? Um, and is there anything you think is missing from the list? Um, you are welcome to ask questions for, pan for, for the panellists as well, but it's not really a sort of Q&A thing. We're trying to, if you could do that by saying what you agree with, what, what you disagree with, and we'll give the panel a chance to come back. So I'll take a few comments at a time. Okay, so, um, yeah, let's start here, and then the two people in front. Go for it. Yep, Sorry. yep. Yep. In that we, or businesses, make money by selling more units of commodity, 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, think about transport, heat, power. Uh, would that not flip the whole uh, sort of regulatory model uh, and how those two can coexist potentially in a national system? Yeah. So how would that? So I've sort of put that in the middle because it's 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 a really interesting point. And do you think what governance do you think is needed to enable those new business propositions to come through? Uh, I don't. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I think it's, it's not really being considered as to what impact that has yeah. on yeah. especially with the coexisting business models. Yeah, uh, brilliant. Okay, thank you. Jim? Yeah, so um, I agree with quite a lot of what's been said. Um, certainly the agility, I know, I know um, the guy who said it's sort of you know, one of the challenging principles that doesn't sound exciting, but I think it's absolutely essential. You know, something that academia would talk about, talk about reflexive governance, that this idea that the system is changing very fast, can governments keep up? I think that's key. The one I'm worried about, and I think it's maybe a matter of what it means, is the systems architect. I've always been worried about it because its genesis was from engineering institutions, and I always read it as a, a sort of bid to bring back planning and control. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe other people interpret it differently. I agree that we need to think about all the different pieces, how they fit together, and crucially, how the costs and benefits, all those areas stack up for different actors, consumers, consumer groups, but I think there is a risk with a sort of architect that it um, fossilizes, if that's not the wrong yep. word, and that you sort of decide how the system is going to be, and you lose that very agility that we need. Yeah. So I think there's a tension between architects and agility. So we might be here in 30 years' time saying, can't believe the system we created yeah. uh, in Oxford it. 30 years ago is <laughs> we're stuck. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, are there other views on that? Because I think that's a, that's a really fundamental shift. Are there others? I'm struggling with the light. So, uh, yeah, in the middle there, I'll take these two views on the system architect point. Yeah. Just on Keith Bell University Strathclyde, just on the system architect thing, uh, the IET put that forward. It was not a central plan. That was not what they were proposing. What they were proposing was a way of managing the codes, actually. So Guy mentioned People read into it what they wanted to read into it. And this idea that it was a good term, a central planner, was what people I meant. That. Yeah. The people who put it forward in the first place admitted the term system architect was a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Because it opens up that interpretation. What would you call it instead? Uh, what would I call it? I would, I would talk about, um, let's say, a, a coherent framework for the management of codes. And given the way the industry many different actors, and this is, I think, core to that, I agree with Jim, you know, the agile regulation is really, really important. Some, the way of managing the relationships between the different actors is absolutely essential, because, as a few of the speakers have said, it's the system as a whole that has to be kind of delivering yeah. what society wants, uh, and there are many different options for how to do that, and there are interactions, I think Mary mentioned, it's difficult to manage the cross-sector interactions. So, the governments as a whole, including codes, is the kind of the key to how to manage those relationships yeah. between yeah. actors of institutions, as individuals, okay. and also the physical entity, the engineering thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. And there is a tension as well between central planning, or kind of a design of where you want to go to, and letting things emerge. Those yeah. Those two ends of the spectrum. And I can see pros and cons at both ends, and I have no idea how, we, how one resolves that, that tension, yeah. given the level yeah. of investment. Yeah. So one thing we've been grappling with a lot in iGov is this question of whether you actually need a clearer sense of direction in order actually to free up innovation at the local level and in terms of new business models. So if you're clear, so in, in a sense that's turning the system architect point on its head, isn't it? That if you if you have a, a very clear sense of direction, then that actually frees people up rather than squashing them into the box that Jim's worried about. So that you know. It's not necessarily an either or. I, I, I don't know. I'm just putting this out there as a suggestion. So uh, there was another point here on the system architect. Yeah, uh, Michael Hargreaves, Norwich Community Solar. Um, I think uh, the issue is not so much system architect, but system architecture. 
Yeah. Um, So what are the sort of problems you encounter doing a local innovative project? Well, that's, that's, that's the middle bit as well that you mentioned before. Which yeah. And I think, I think consultation is something which needs to be broadened from the academic industry, uh, government access to include more people at the grid edge who are working from the grassroots upwards. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that, in my head at least, that relates back to Mary's point about the position of incumbents in the regulatory system, because what you're saying is that at the moment you don't feel like there's adequate consultation or engagement of people who are working in those not quite energy system spaces, if you like. Is that, is that a fair comment? Yeah, I think there needs to be recognition. We, we don't have the same resources behind us to... Yep. Okay, great. We've had quite a go around the system architecture issue. There's a few more comments. I'll take the man over here. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's that point. My name is Alan Thompson from Exchange Networks. I was speaking for the DNO Inspectors. Yep. So one of the things we've been doing differently over the last few years is we, is we do a lot more stakeholder engagement. Yep. Uh, but it is very much a problem that um, uh, we do just talk to the usual suspects. And you know, we have three and a half million customers and we can't speak to every single one. So we do need bodies who represent those customers yep. who speak with their voice. Yeah. Those bodies don't typically exist. We speak to local authorities, and it certainly helps. But um, I think some way to be able to communicate you know, so that we can deliver what customers want. Yeah. But then once we do find out what customers want, it's very difficult to give them what they want. <laughs> So that's, that's a, it, that sounds to me like an echoing of this getting rid of boxes for regulator activity and the questions around sort of interoperability. interoperability. Is that... Uh, yeah, OK, great. And there was a man just in front. Yep. Hi, I'm, I'm Colin Morgan from the Law School Lisbon. And um, I brought Perry, so um, I think there was a couple of points. The first point, um, Guy's point about the digitalization. So energy effectively is increasing kind of data and data of energy. Yep. So Yep. In that if we were to, for example, operationalize the climate change act, we would have to talk about baseline governance for the energy system. Because we have to start reducing some of the energy in tangible using the reduction of tangible commodity. We have to start thinking about reducing energy demand, and that energy demand will entail carbon emission reductions. And that is all based on the data infrastructure, which we measure a reduction in growth rate through baseline. So we have to start thinking about new governance arrangements around relative to a baseline and data. So, uh, by base, I don't quite get what you mean by baseline. Do you mean the sort of, do you mean a legal minimum, or have I misinterpreted well, that? Um, if we were to operationalize, for example, the climate change, yeah. it, it is already effectively based on the 1990 carbon emission regime. Okay? Yeah. So, and this is then also something which is effectively a lot of business model within the energy service space and so on, that also evolved around reductions relative to baseline. Uh, so, so there's business models that exist entirely yeah. And that this will have to become more systemic if the target, for example, the 80% um, carbon emission reduction is supposed to be a target of the energy system. Okay, great. I've noticed. Oh, um, yeah, Jan. So, Jan, we're at the University of Edinburgh. Um, I think there's a missing middle in there yep. in the sense of.
how do you create? You know, the, I like the vision and leadership kind of idea, and very sympathetic to the to the clients of all of the time. But it's still in the realm of the should. You know, there's a lot of well, we should be doing this, we should be creating the other, but there's no obvious routes. <laughs> Seems to me we're going around in a lot of circles here to move forward in a more systematic and yep. democratic, dare I say, fashion. So how do we take people with us, because it's uh, mostly I work on issues of heat and energy efficiency in buildings, and that is a wonderful example of a complex, messy problem where we really do need to have that wider debate amongst yeah. the various interests that are piling into that without some kind of regional, local um, governance bodies in there, and yet there's a doing and throwing about who the appropriate authorities um, are to do that. I think Guy referred to that. Well, how are we going to get from here to some solutions, and what about political um, leadership? Yeah, influence? yeah. Okay, yeah, so what's interesting about that as well is the link between, I think you're saying there's a missing middle in terms of the, um, you know, the... The, the technical side, as in how, how we actually shift that, your point about, you said, you said systematic and democratic, so there's a technical aspect and a people aspect to that. Yeah. Okay, yep. <coughs> So I was going to ask you that. What do you want to change? But what what are the biggest blocks to that happening? Because the technology is there, right? Well, <laughs> So that's the it's very difficult, but you know, put it together in such a way that it, it can respond more dynamically to you know, these sort of yeah. rapid developments, really. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll just take a couple more quick points and then I'm going to uh, hand over to Catherine. Yeah, so uh, Sarah and then the gentleman here. Yeah. Yeah. interconnectedness in terms of the different energy vectors that could supply different services and so I wonder how your energy governance framework can be flexible and responsive enough to be able to kind of to regulate with that all that level of uncertainty and so as not to lock out particular options yeah. and favour others. And, and are you talking about developing those visions at a local level or national or both interact? How does that? 
And I think there probably has to be both. I don't know how they would fit together. Yeah. But certainly all the work that's going on in Greater Manchester is about an energy system for Greater Manchester that's kind of connecting heat, transport, electricity with centralised generation, decentralised generation. But that has to fit within your wider, you know, that's nested within a kind of a, a wider vision for the UK as a whole. And yeah. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Last point, yeah. Yeah, um, I'd like to um, come back to these two points and uh, the issue of architecture, because I think architecture is a stepping stone that collects the new vision or the, the concepts of the new vision of the energy system from a broader uh, sense of what's possible, aligns it to where we want to go, and then sets out the tableau, if you like, upon which regulation needs to be designed. Mm. So, yeah, I haven't left nearly enough room for <laughs> what I think is a really good summary there and maybe a good place for you to leap in, Catherine. So you have the vision and then you have the architecture in response to that vision and that allows people to do innovative things on the ground and not to be constrained by the um, inflexible regulation. Well, it sets out the procedure to, to yeah. regulation after architecture rather than constraining it. Okay, so it's actually like we're actually getting four steps here then. We've got vision, architecture, regulation, and then people doing stuff. Okay, I'm, I might be having to break out the second whiteboard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I might wheel it over in case. So, uh, Catherine, I know there's loads of people who want to come in, but I'm going to ask Catherine to do okay. 10 minutes on how this relates to iGov's work, and then we'll have another round of discussion, and we'll especially look at the, the points where I think there's some really interesting emerging consensus on where the biggest shifts are needed. Um, so I am going to wheel the other whiteboard over here in case I've, I feel like I might want it. Do that while well, you're mid speech, Catherine. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you've got about uh, five to ten minutes, and I'm gonna be strict with you after that. Yeah, go for it. Well, <laughs> so, um, so those of, those of you who haven't been on the iGov web, web, website, uh, there are now about 600 things on there, and uh, pretty much everything that has been talked about today, there is something that's a blog or there's something that has, has been written on on it and when I talk about a blog what we try to do is um, what we think of them as academic blogs so they're they're like a blog you can just read them like an ordinary blog but situated within them is all the literature that you need to kind of go further if you want to um, and so for, quite, for some of those questions please do go and ha have a have a look at that and, and I would also say we're about to have a MOOC massive online course which we're, we're trying to explain all of that as well so do sign up to that that's kind of coming along um, so the list the list of problems with the current governance that we've heard about here you know match um, obviously the, the kind of problems that we see with um, the current governance system as well and um, we think that we've got at least a framework which is for the whole system and which um, is integrated across sectors and across scales and which is democratic and legitimate um, and which is you know deals with this issue of getting somewhere uh, in time to meet the climate change uh, budgets uh, but at the same time be adaptable so just just to sort of look at these kind of issues that we've gone through. I mean, clearly in Britain, we do not have visionary, visionary um, and aligned leadership. 
and that is a, a really important part for you know making the whole thing thing work and we are we therefore you know are difficult and I think it's been very interesting to sort of see the difference between the Conservatives and the Labour Party over Extinction Rebellion, basically, for example, this last week. So, you know, one of the issues is what do you do if you don't have visionary and um, aligned leadership? And at least what you try and do is get a process in place which means that the, uh, those with political power or influence are less able to do so if, it's, if they try to wield it in their interest rather than in the interest of the sort of public interests. You, you try to have a process which is um, transparent. You, you try to have a process which is engaging of people um, and inclusive. Uh, and in those ways, it becomes harder then for people to, to continue just to keep on going because it sort of suits certain parts of the system. But that is a huge problem, and I, I, we, we totally kind of get that. Um, one issue that we uh, set up is that answers some of these problems is legitimate decision making. So we believe, uh, it's, you know, as Guy is saying, we, we believe in having a strong um, government with capacity who are capable of leading um, a, a policy um, and to take decisions down to the distributional level. It, at the moment, major societal decisions are taken essentially by bodies which really don't have that legitimacy. And that, to a large reason, is because Bayes has devolved that power to an executor, often off-gen, but others elsewhere. And we think that's wrong. We think that the Secretary of State has to be making those decisions down to a distributional level, and therefore we need to have a strong uh, a sort of uh, government able to make those kind of decisions, which, as we know, it currently uh, doesn't have. Um, we we um, we think that there needs to be more coordination, as as has has been talked about. We have said that you need to. Um, we think that you need to have a new body. I'll kind of come back to that in a moment. We need to have a new body, which is an energy transformation. Commission, and we think that that body would be the parallel to the Committee on Climate Change. So you have the Committee on Climate Change, which gives its advice to government, uh, to Bayes, actually, um, about budgets, and then and then that advice goes nowhere. That's it's not in Ofgem. It doesn't go down to codes. It doesn't go down to licences. It just stays there. Um, and the CCC has got this very difficult job of putting out policies, but it's not allowed to, it's, it's, it's not allowed to really say what policies are the right policies. We think there needs to be a parallel body which um, essentially takes the CCC science, what that needs, and that body would say, well, this is what we need in order to meet those targets. And that would also give advice in to uh, the Secretary of State who would be making the decisions. Now, our view of this is, is, is a bit on this kind of this sort of discussion. We think that it's it's actually as what Becky said earlier on, that you have to have a strong decision, a strong direction setting in order to then free up innovation, particularly at the local level, and to allow bottom up optimization and bottom up kind of movement. Um, so it, our view is is that, that the world the energy world is decentralizing it's digitalizing um, and that that it's that that's not happening because there isn't a strong coordinator saying we've got to get to you know wherever in order to meet the CCC targets and there are these myriad things that are happening across Britain, none of which are coordinated with each other. We don't think that works, and so we're just trying to kind of move it together. So we, we see the ETC as the Energy Transformation Commission as this thing which is um, both gathering information, engaging with people, finding out what's happen, happening, but also um, 
giving advice, also understanding what we consider to be, you know, the half dozen or so really major key energy policy decisions that need to be taken, like rollout of uh, decarbonising build, um, retrofitting buildings, for example. You know, what to do with gas networks, and so forth. And a very, very large part of what uh, is needed in all of this is an equity process, because. Uh, it, you know, I, we, I believe we are now in a post-trade-off world between the environment, um, uh, security, um, and equity type issues. We, we need all of, we have to have all of them. It's not like we can trade them off anymore. We've got to have all of them. Uh, and if you look at the, often if you look at the sort of the really nitty-gritty day-to-day problems of how you do uh, take a sustainable action. It doesn't get taken because of problems to do with jobs or because of problems to do um, with, you know, somebody not quite, you know, it's going to be too expensive for certain parts of society. There has to be a process, an inherent process, whereby the equity decisions are kind of upfront dealt with, are kind of confronted and dealt with uh, in order that it is not the equity decision because, because you, in a sense, you can't, you can't really take a decision if you know that somebody is going gonna, is gonna to really suffer from that decision. So you have to make sure that there is a process that stops that and then you can take the sustainable decision. So in our mind, the equity is becoming ever more important. It always was important, but it really is important and it has to be absolutely embedded in the way that we think about things. Two more minutes. Sorry. Um, so... Within all of that, um, having said all of that, let me just kind of go down through this. So, the kind of points that I got. Political leadership, yeah, absolutely important, but very difficult at the moment. So, let's try and get a process in place. Um, absolutely, you've got to engage people. We're, we're saying that the ETC is the coordinator, would be the coordinator of that. Um, there's a lack of coordination. We're saying the ETC would be also coordinating that. Um, we think that there has to be um, a capacity in bays um, for the Secretary of State to take distributional decisions. Now, at this point, we then kind of get to this middle area that sort of um, Jan is talking about, kind of the missing middle. And, and I think that this is actually a really interesting point. My kind of big issue, really, about Ofgem, and I genuinely really don't understand it, you talk to the senior people in Ofgem, you know, your level, Dermot, whoever, they always say the right thing. They absolutely, you've said, completely said the right thing. <laughs> you, you take, not always. You, 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 <laughs> right, 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 maybe, maybe not always, but in, in general, the view is, yes, we want this, yes, we want that, yes, we want, th want that. And then, then you look at the actions, what actually comes out of Ofgem, and it's always uh, at best neutral, and often it's a step back for sustainability. And I honestly do not understand how you get from this problem of what the, the top says and actually what, what those 800 people end up doing. Now, the easiest way, probably, to kind of get to... Um, to, to have, have a sort of a strategic, we're going to make it happen sort of thing, is what a lot of people would do. Change off gems duties, and they can be this kind of um, organisation which makes it happen. And there are many, many, many people out there who say, look, this is actually the way to go. Don't sort of fiddle around with an energy transformation commission, a new kind of commission with all of this. Get, just, just change off gems duties, and they'll do it. Look, they say the right things. <laughs> and then so I, I completely get that. Were, if Ofgem actually was in any way progressive, I'm apologies, but really, if it were, <laughs> then absolutely I can see it would be the way to go. And I would be happy with that. And it's a bit, I'm a bit like that with DNOs and DSPs as well, whether or not you can trust DNOs to actually do the job. Um, but... The, the history so far has been, actually, because Ofgem has not taken those decisions, we've sort of felt you have to get something else in there to kind of break that. Now, at that point, we're saying, OK, you've kind of got the ETC, which is going to make these decisions. 
you're going to strip Ofgem off back to being an economic regulator, and then you're going to have the CCC, which is going to tell the Secretary of State what has to happen in science. You've got the ETC that's going to work out broadly, in some kind of sense, what that means in terms of policies, electric vehicles, you know, how to, how to get skills going to really have a rollout for retrofit or whatever it might be. And then you kind of move into what we've called this independent integrated system operator, which sort of deals with the technicalities of it. Um, and also allows markets. Now, in, in all of that, we think that that sets the direction, but it allows flexibility for change. It allows there to be, to be it, but that it allows things to be um, adaptable. And we, we believe through that, you're taking the, the movement of the energy system down really into, the, into distribution, and you're really uh, allowing um, the demand side and storage be on an equal footing with uh, supply, and you're allowing uh, people to become engaged, and you're allowing people, if they wish, to simply exist in the distribution level. They never have to go up to trans transmission if they wish to. Same, and then on, and the gas is somewhat different, different, but basically the same kind of particular theory. Okay, probably Great. too much information. Thank Didn't you. That, I think. Yep. Great, thank you. So we've got. 20 minutes left to crack this. Uh, and this is uh, how I'm proposing to do that. I'm going to uh, just ask our panellists for quick reflections, something that's music to your ears or something that really worries you, uh, just sort of like one minute. Um, and then we're going to have another round of comments from you guys and our prioritised people who haven't had a chance to speak yet. And if you don't normally speak up in these sorts of fora, give it a go. Um, and uh, so we'll do that, and I am going to give all our panellists a Can I just say one thing, line. just for, to Guy? So I don't, well, what that means is I don't think there is one system architect, which, and I also yeah. don't like that phrase. So I, I think okay. that you have to split that up. They can't, Great. yeah. Brilliant. Okay, right, let's see how far we can get in 20 minutes. Mary, do you want to just say what sure. struck you about the discussion so <laughs> um, far? So I'm very struck by the top of Ofgem saying the right things and then the actions coming out. <laughs> um, we need a longer conversation about that, for sure. Um, uh, I don't think I've been at Ofgem quite long enough to know what, what particular pain lies behind that remark, but I'm very, very keen to find out. Um, the, one of the things that resonated with me very much was the discussion around um, stakeholder engagement and the, how you get all the right voices in the room, which is incredibly difficult because... Um, you know, the, the big companies, um, grid, the big suppliers all have regulatory affairs teams who, you know, eagerly await our consultations and, and respond, and we take all that very seriously. But that is clearly only some of the voices, and that's not a means of um, testing other views that is going to work for, for other voices. Um, my only bit of prior experience that's relevant to this was uh, while I was at the FCA, I was involved in the early stages of setting up the payment systems regulator, and the issue there was that the payment systems, BACs and CHAPs and so on, were run by the big banks, um, but a lot of innovative fintech companies wanted to come in and plug into them and use them, and they could only do that if they um, partnered with a big bank, and they didn't want to partner with a big bank because they were trying to eat the big bank's lunch. And so um, there, was a, there was a sort of really knotty governance problem about how do you get the payment systems run by and for the full community of interest um, when that community is quite fragmented and some have a lot more resource than, than others and it is a really difficult challenge to solve. I do think we need to, to try and solve it um, in energy and I think how the uh, less powerful and vocal bits of the industry get to play into things like code governance. I know it sounds incredibly arcane and boring, but I think it's absolutely fundamental and it's a real design challenge to get that stuff right. Thank you. Okay. Charlotte. Stop there. Um, so I've, I've heard some really strong themes of every, sort of every player in the, in the system looking upwards and hoping that yeah. the, kind of the entity in the layer above them is going to help them take the right next step and I know that's certainly how entities within national grid feel they're very bounded by the regulatory structures that they live within despite getting lots of pressure to 
work outside of the Rio structure, let's say, or be innovative with Rio, ultimately we're just bounded to follow the money. And it really struck me, Mary, your comments about, yes, maybe the right thing to do for Ofgem might be to think about more broadly how regulation may change, but it's more comfortable um, to look up to government because ultimately it's their responsibility. They set the frameworks. And then, Guy, in your very first statement, you said, you know, you feel like Bayes have a lot of responsibility for setting the architecture, but A, they don't realise it, and B, they're maybe not um, capable of, of doing it. So we sort of have this situation where everyone's looking up and the people at the top don't realise that everyone's looking up. And um, it, yeah. what, kind of, what compounds that is the situation we find ourselves in, the sort of modern reality of existing without a parliamentary majority. So let's say 30 years ago when we had the, the, kind of the, the last major transformation in governance with privatisation, political decision-making was completely different from how it works today. So we probably have to get used to the reality of consensus-driven politics where we go to lowest common denominator or minority-led politics or whatever you want to call it. This is going to be the structure within which transformation needs to happen. So to be able to enable, at the very top, to enable a new vision to be created and set and then disseminated, we do need a completely different way of achieving what was achieved 30 years ago by a parliamentary majority. How do you achieve that vision and then setting of the, of the architecture around it in the broadest sense of architecture it feels like that's the point where we need to go to yeah. thank you go ahead. Um, okay so huge amount covered there's a few a few themes that, that popped out one of the so, so one is about this this the, the flexibility in two senses we talked about flexibility in the sense of making sure that the market design is is agile etc I think that's really important but the, the, the question of how flexible the system is is going to be the power system in, in particular. Like how is it going to be able to? Uh, the, how much actually is there in the system that is going to mean really that we don't have to build as many nukes as we thought to um, uh, to to meet our, our climate change uh, targets? Like how do we how do we find out with your school and that you know how can they actually make some money out of out of the the, the system they're providing etc. So I think. But this, this is a kind of market question, really. Like, how do you know? Who, who, where's the market I can go to where I can sell this extra extra capacity? Um, and it's the same with uh, Jonathan. I think made the point about energy as a service as well. Like, how do we enable this this stuff? This to, to find out how much actual, you know, flexibility at local level there there is, so that you, you can and then translate that into a national um, question. A key point, you know, would say this is that you know testing and demonstration and lots of the um, demonstrations that are going on, and lots of people in the room are involved with them. Uh, we need to be actually learning from that, not just doing an isolated demonstration and then writing a report and then sitting sitting on a shelf. So, I've written, so, so that that question of flexibility is, has 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 come up, and but that that leads us quite quickly to this institutional um, this institutional gap, as it were. Um, just a quick couple of thoughts on system markets. Architect, it's quite quite important. I was one of those people when I first heard the term when I was in government. I absolutely, uh, I just went crazy. I was so I was like, oh god, partly because it was the IET. I was just like, oh god, these are all these old people from bloody CGB. They're just as their last hurrah. They're trying <laughs> to recreate what uh, uh, and undo any of uh, all of the benefits of it. And uh, actually, as I understood it. Properly, we're not, you know, and they did a, like a terrible sales job. Um, but understanding it properly about how how actually you're going to the architecting process, um, which is the point I was making about Bayes. You know, they're very good set up to say, right, we're going to do CFDs, bang, we can we can get all the institutional infrastructure. They can do that, but they don't sit there and say, hold on a sec, how the hell do I make a decision about whether I build a new nuclear power station? Or what am I going to do about um, uh, smart, uh, whatever the replacement for FITS is called? Sorry, I can't remember. I went through about 15 smart iterations. Export smart export guarantee. <laughs> Sorry, you can tell I've been out of government for six months. Um, you know, there's no, the minister's sat there and going, how do I make a decision between these, these two things, which are both part of the same system? And that, so that architecting process and whether there's a separate institution that needs to be uh, doing that, I think, is, is, is really important. 
I could challenge the vision point, but I'm, I'm, I don't have to do. I don't have to defend the government anymore, so I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you really want to ask? Them? Unless you want, unless someone wants to ask. Take another about. round of comments. Let's start with people who didn't get a chance before. Um, one, two, three. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, I think that the energy sector is undergoing decentralization, and as we see in other sectors, um, legislation cannot keep up with new technologies and new innovations. So I think that what would be important would be to, to give more powers to the intermediaries that will then set more specific standards and then um, act according to guidelines given by higher up, so by the government, for example. Um, yeah, so I think that that, that could be happening in the as we see in other sectors, as transport, accommodation, Uber, Airbnb, that it doesn't really work if you impose um, a law on yeah. these types of platforms. Can you just say what you mean by an intermediary? Who are the intermediaries? Uh, for example, the, the platform provider, the peer to peer services. So okay. That, for example, consumers are a member of. Yeah. And then, okay. Uh, the, yeah. Great. Thank you. And there was a point down. Yeah. Uh, uh, who else? There's somebody at the top there. Yeah. Mm. Top. yeah. Um, I'm interested in Catherine's comment about culture uh, throughout the organisation and I would characterise the energy regime of having changed and that's the Opgems and, and the Dinos and, and all those big corporates having changed their culture over the last 30 years to accept the market but they're nowhere near grasping the culture of the need for urgent change, fixing the equity cracks that are, that are um, coming in the system. And, and so I, I really do agree with that idea that down in the bowels of the system there's a lot more accepting change that needs to come and, and be proactive about their role in fixing it. So was that related to Catherine's point that we might be getting things right in terms of uh, in, in terms of articulating the problem, but still the system grinds on and the people working in that system are, are not necessarily accepting the changes. And, you know, everyone's role is um, in, in terms of... Uh, I mean, we're moving to a time where centralised organisations are no longer yeah. completely how we do things, right? So everyone in Ofgem needs to be sensing, but they need to sense society and where society yeah. wants them to go, not to sense where the regime is at and be part of the regime culture, yeah. because the regime has not yet got to terms with the fact that centralised is moving to decentralised and it looks quite different. They've not got to terms with the fact that urgent climate change requires massive, yeah. different decisions in investment where you actually say no to something that would have been straightforward in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Let's have and uh, just behind and then. Sorry, did you want to come in? Yeah. So I'll take the man at the back and then down here. Yeah. Good yeah, morning. Um, John Taylor from the Greater Southeast um, Energy Hub. Uh, we heard yesterday from Patrick Goldcorn about the local energy um, program that they're uh, um, putting in to help deliver the clean growth strategy. And we're seeing a lot of the kind of next phase local energy infrastructure being pushed out to LEPs and local authorities. So, for example, we've now got five regional energy hubs um, in our area in the southeast. There's um, six LEP regional energy plans written by six different consultants. So there is a danger that you could see a real mix of solutions start coming together. And I can see the value of that kind of energy transformation commission providing some science and evidence back to oversight to kind of give some common steerage to these so it sounds like you're arguing for a similar thing where you allow local areas to do their own thing within a much clearer overall framework, is yeah, that I right? Yeah, I think it needs yeah. to tie in to see how each area is contributing to those yeah. national targets. Mm. Okay, 
Um, I've got someone down here, and I just, just, can I just have an idea of who else wants to come in quickly before we end? Okay, so I'll take here and then uh, one, two, I know Jim wanted to come back quickly, so these are going to have to be sort of quick fire things. Um, go for it. Okay, um, I'll try and keep it brief. I really would like to build on some of the conversation around setting a framework for uh, local decision making. Um, some of the things I disagreed with, so when you were talking about the CCC's role, you talked about us advising the base, and I didn't recognise that because for me, I experience on a daily basis the huge networks which we leverage, you know, talking to Treasury, talking to DAs, talking to DFT, talking to Ofgen, MHCLG, um, and I, it just seemed quite siloed. I worry about this concept of an energy trans, trans transition commission that decides on policies because I worry if that's democratic. <coughs> now, I welcome the emphasis on equity, but I wonder is there a better way to resolve issues around equity than our current democratic system processes? Often I do think they need a clearer statutory role on, on uh, delivering carbon budgets. I think that would really help. What do I like about what you said? So you talked about taking the movement down to, to distribution, allowing demand side and storage to be on equal footing, allowing people to just stick at distribution level if they want. I think that's great, and I think that ties into what is an emerging uh, vision which has come out of what people have been saying. I think it is really about this link between the national and the local, and it comes back to what Tom Hayes was saying yesterday uh, about uh, capacity building, what central government can do to uh, help local authorities and other local bodies develop business cases, make investable propositions. Okay. And I wonder, just as a closing thought, whether, you know, if you are thinking about constituting a new body, would it make sense to actually constitute that from different parts of government so you could bring in expertise from the DFT, from cabinet office, yes. from treasury, from object? Thank you. Okay, so I had one, two, three, and then I think we're going to have to close it. Yeah. Susan Brush, Strathclyde University. Just a few random points here. One of the issues is we've got a direction of travel, but the destination is really nebulous. We don't know what that's going to look like. Are we going to electrify anything? Are we going to carbonize our <coughs> How much are we going to use to land? So we don't know exactly what, what we're talking, where we're going to end up. Um, lack of a competent body, or competent bodies have been mentioned by many. I think that means no one is going to say it. Um, people in a general lack of literacy in society and in organisations about the bigger picture. You know, if you're in an okay. organisation, you know your bit, you might know your bit really well, but like the freedom or new experience to do something else. And you know, you could you could do with your development to the general public. People okay. want their peer to be trading, they don't want fracking, they don't want their own community to be able to be on and they don't want to pay much. And one one thing you don't want means you need something of something else. So to just to see a bit of a bigger picture so across organisations as well as the public. And I would say the members of the public have the right not to engage and still yep. be, you still have the right for the lights to be on at a Okay, so it's interesting in this last discussion how these questions of democracy are really coming to the fore, so, and, and also how you create a more strategic process for that public engagement rather than, you know, people saying no to fracking here and yes to community energy there, so, great. Jess? Uh, Jess Britton, University of Exeter, not quite Just kind of building on the comments that you made about um, connecting up the kind of national and local, I think it's really important to recognise that there is a missing model and those institutional structures do not while it's great to have things like the hubs, their role um, is not to feel like government's role, they're about delivering projects on the ground. And so there is a huge gap there. Um, and I think it makes it very difficult for organisations like Ofgem and Bayes that are, are now actually quite distant from where yeah. innovation is happening yeah. in energy okay. systems. Um, and I think we've had conversations about devolved carbon budgets in the past, but I think actually things have moved on not now, and we probably need to revisit that debate, particularly as this idea of um, national and local citizen assembly starts to be developed, and who knows where that's going to go in the next 12 great. months. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, brilliant. Okay, Jim, very, very quickly, and then I'm going to give a very quick <coughs> right reply to our panellists. Jim Walton, New Perth, New Zealand, I forgot to say that last time. <laughs> um, three responses to the question. One, I agree on equity. We have to get up front about this. 
even now, net demand net zero. And that, I think I think that should be led by base. They really need to look across the piece of the some types of the energy impacts of everything and, and, and think about what we need to, to deal with that. Second, I'm I, a bit like Jenny, I'm not entirely convinced about the new body thing. I can see why you're impatient to have one because the current bodies aren't quite good, but I do think the CCC sort of characterization you gave was limited. Actually, they've gone a lot further than it was originally intended yeah. and do advocate particular policies and they engage across government. So, I, I, you know, it's probably working with them quite closely. I think they're a lot more strategic than was first intended, and I think that's the right thing. And then the third one follows up on Jess. I, 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 I do think we need something at a more regional or decentralized level as a government's body, particularly when we're thinking about heat. I was really struck by what Mary said about Ofgem not being, I mean, you can deal with Scotland, but if that's the greatest union can deal with, you know, there's the need for decentralization, and that brings together things that currently exist in grid, in Ofgem, bays, in other places to think strategically and logistically, particularly about things like heat transitions, where, in the end, people might not have choice. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to give a quick right to reply to our panel. We'll go uh, Guy, Charlotte, Mary, Catherine, if that's okay. Um, and we've probably got less than a minute each, I'm afraid. But final thoughts. Guy. So I'm going to just finish my, my, my teaser on the vision thing. So I, I think we're all right for vision. Um, we've got a Climate Change Act, pretty strong cross-party support. Um, uh, but the reality is that... Uh, you know, the, the, I, I challenge the point that there, there aren't trade-offs. There are real trade-offs. You know, that if if it was if it was you know, government would be desperate if all EVs were super cheap. They're getting there. If there was an alternative heating technology which was low carbon and people really liked, they'd be and was cheap. They they, they, they would be all over it. Um, but it's just it's just it's just hard because there are there are there are real trade-offs. So I think. Um, what, what the thing that I've, I've taken from this conversation, because we've, we've gone back to that kind of, um, uh, just, it comes back to local planning actually being so so important and those local institutions, because you've got bottom up a huge appetite from local government to be taking on those trade offs actually, and uh, but they have no powers and no money and actually no. Um, and I take the point on energy hubs from from John's. Great, they're 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 real step forward, but they are, but they are. They, you're not going to get a really detailed, you know, granular plan of the kind you you really need in those in those areas. It's just not not enough money. But so so allowing uh, mechanisms, whether they're markets or or institutions, which are going to allow that enthusiasm to turn into real concrete actions, I think is. Is, is, a, is a massive governance challenge going forward. Thank you. Charlotte? So um, I'll start with the vision bit as well. I think when um, I'm saying that the vision is, there's a bit of the vision, vision that's missing, what I mean is the, um, the organisational architecture. There's been lots of calls from, from everyone here for the organisations and institutions within the energy systems to do things differently, but almost all of them are in some way regulated or controlled by some other part of the, of the architecture, and that's not just the regulated monopoly entities, it's also the suppliers with their licences, but it's also Ofgem, it's the CCC, it's the NIC, who kind of everyone gazing upwards. So we're expecting a lot of change from organisations that are able to work well within their regulatory boundaries, um, but not so able to change to make spontaneous change. Now, the great thing about having lots of bureaucratic organisations, having regulated monopolies, having regulated entities, is they do what they're told. Particularly in the UK, we're really great at following rules and doing what we're told. And so one of the challenges of, of working with lots of regulated monopolies and bureaucratic entities <laughs> is that if they're being told to do something with these old regulatory structures, these old mandates, old concepts of what the organisational landscape should look like, if their objectives and, um, and aims are set by something of a kind of a vision of the, of the industry that was relevant 30 years ago, we're diligently doing what we're told, but it's against an old framework. So what's missing is the organisational vision. What's missing, you know, maybe I, I don't agree with every aspect of what IGOF has proposed, but it is an organisational vision that would then engender real change amongst the organisations set within the system that we want to do things fundamentally differently. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Mary? Um, I'll pick up a little bit on the 
Um, legitimacy question and, and the suggestion about a citizens' assembly. And I think it's really, it's a really, really difficult one. Um, so regulators um, have definitely, in many sectors, been caught out by a kind of wave of public opinion uh, that has, um, has, has wanted regulators to be much uh, more focused on issues of fairness than, than we have been. So economic regulators have typically been focused on issues of efficiency, trying to keep average prices low, and have not thought about um, the distribution of prices. That prompted a huge amount of public backlash and resulted in Ofgem putting most of its organisational energy over the last year into implementing a retail price cap so that the price that you pay is closer to what your neighbour pays uh, than it would have been a year or so ago. Um, so the, the challenge, I think, for us is to uh, get better at staying closer to what people are really worried about and making sure that the framework that exists to protect consumers is actually tackling what consumers are most interested in. My word of warning, though, is that if you ask people what they really want, what, you know, many people will say, I want to pay less than uh, less than my neighbour or the same as my neighbour, they won't say, I want to decarbonise. Some people will say, I want to decarbonise. Extinction Rebellion will tell you that. But a lot of people just want rather boring old world um, energy outcomes. And I think one of the really difficult, the really difficult things in this area is what is the right amount of kind of... Um, Legitimacy, legitimacy to sort of have in the debate. So you want broad, you can't decarbonise without broad-based popular support for doing it. But if you get too specific about asking people what you want, they may not tell you the thing that you were hoping for, <laughs> okay, I guess. A, thank you, Mary. I'm going to give a very quick final word. Yeah. So I'm sorry if I kind of reduced what I said about the CCC. So I think the CCC is a completely wonderful organisation. And, of course, it does this huge span of discussion all over the place. I think it's completely, completely wonderful. I know I meant to see that it's, like, narrow. Absolutely not. But what I, what, what we, what I meant by that is that, you know, you have your budgets, you give your advice on that to uh, Parliament, and then... And then there is no way that that is cascaded down into off-gem or codes or whatever. And what I meant from that was that, you know, that side of the CCC has got to be completely embedded within society and within institutions to make sure institutions act in that way. And then the politics of it is that if, if the CCC is perceived to go too far over the line towards policy and what should happen, then then that undermines its strength on the science side and that's why we were thinking of having this other organization which was the thing that in a sense its job was to say every year to government well you know the ccc says this and you've managed to reduce emissions by this amount because there's only you know another fifty thousand electric vehicles or whatever that you know they have that absolute that's what they're saying to government to <coughs> do. so i'm sorry if it came across from that um I am coming from this, though, that, that we have to cut carbon emissions by a certain amount by a certain time. And if, if we um, have a one and a half degrees, that is going to be tighter than it currently is. And we have done OK for offshore wind, but pretty much in every other sector, we have failed. And we cannot carry on as we currently are and meet our carbon emissions and therefore we really have to start getting more direction into the system um, which is legitimate and which is flexible and which listens to people but we have to have more direction we cannot continue with a government that devolves um, through an independent regulator that has this in, has this kind of future customers uh, part of its duties but which it does not Think about it other than in the terms of price, basically, as, you know, to do with equity. We have, we, you know, the current system is not working, and therefore we really do have to change it. Now, um, we need to be right. right, and the final thing, well, just two things. First of all, I think it's interesting that the NIC is looking at a regulatory review at the moment, and I do hope 
that, that that comes up with kind of really fundamental change about the fit for purpose nature of regulation. Um, secondly, codes are absolutely essential, but really it's a very simple problem. You just stop self-regulation. There is no other country in the world that has self-regulation. You simply stop it. It just you you just get rid of that problem. It is not a problem, as far as I'm concerned. And finally, off Jim, why don't you start to have a a, a, a reforming the energy vision um, type project, as happened in New York, New York State? has got the New York Rev, why don't you do that? Because I think that I think that Northern Ireland is going to do that. So I think it'd be great if you did that. All right. Thank you. So I think what I'm really taking out of this is what we do at that sort of how we get the top level vision down to the middle level architecture that Charlotte was talking about. And a strong thing that's come out of this final session is the need for legitimacy and democratic decision making in the context of eye-wateringly fast. And coordinated fast. local market, yeah. you know, coordination yeah. at a local level, because okay. it's not going to happen at the local level if we don't have that. And we've Brilliant. got to have it at the local level, Thank bottom you. up. So we will, be, we will be using this discussion in uh, fine-tuning um, iGov's work over the, 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 the final few months of the project, and I just wanted to uh, give a huge thanks to everyone here for your contributions, and a uh, particular thanks to our panel. Yes, I think it's been really, really lively, and... Uh, yeah, there's, there's lots of stuff for us to do in our various roles. I think this is quite a significant challenge. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much, Thanks. everyone. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank and I think there's a cup of tea to be had over the way. Is that right? Yeah.